Well, good morning. We are glad that you have joined us, and we will begin our time together by looking to a few verses from Psalm 67. So if you'll please stand, thank you, Joe. If you'll please stand, a few verses from 67, I encourage you to look at it later on. It's a Psalm of David, and it says this, God be merciful to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us that your way may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. O let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you shall judge the people righteously and govern the nations on earth. Selah. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Then the earth shall yield her increase. God, our own God, shall bless us. God shall bless us, and all the ends of the earth shall fear him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for a desire to want to praise you. Uh, Thank you for taking us from being dead in our trespasses and sins, being sheep that have gone astray, and calling us and revealing to us our need for your son, Jesus. And through faith in him and the mighty work, the miraculous work of the Holy Spirit, bringing to us new life, regenerating us from being dead to alive in Christ forevermore. May our time together, Father, be pleasing to you. May it bring you glory. May it point others to Christ. And for those who know him, may they continue to cling to him. May we continue to cling to him. In his name I pray. Amen. Sweet. 
Amen, amen, amen. I don't suppose I could hear that song without turning to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, where it speaks of Jesus Christ being the same yesterday, today, and forever. How many of you are grateful that that is truth? In James chapter 1, verse 17, it talks about every good gift, every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights in whom there is no variable of changing. So God is immutable. Why is that important? Because with him, he doesn't change the rules in the middle of the game. What we read and understand from the scriptures, the Old Testament being put into Greek before Christ was born onto this earth, what we see in the Old Testament and New Testament, thousands of years worth of God's word, what God says is so. He doesn't change. God doesn't change. His word doesn't change. Times change. Everything else changes, but he doesn't, and neither does his word. And so we can rest ashore of his promises, right? And that's a great blessing to me. You know, we were singing, uh, How Great Thou Art. So sings my soul. And really, that's the song that's important, is the song that comes from the heart, isn't it? And it's God who creates a new heart within that enables you and I to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And so people can be standing, singing one of those great hymns of the faith, How Great Thou Art, How Great Thou Art. And yet it means nothing to God if it isn't sung from a heart that's been regenerated by Him and the song is being lifted up from the person's entire inner being. How many understand that? It may sound good to others. God is enthroned in the praises of His people. And He loves when the praises of His people arise to him turn in your bibles to luke chapter 9 as we continue on in our studies uh, the life and times of jesus according to the gospel of luke the gospel of luke you can find uh, this same question inquiry that jesus makes of his apostles you can find it in matthew chapter 16 you can find it in mark chapter 8 and then there's an element of, of really the, the matter of who Christ is found in John chapter 6. For in John chapter 6, he had already said, I am the bread of life, I am the living bread. He also talked that his, his flesh was food indeed, his blood was drink indeed. And of course he was talking about the spirit because it's the spirit that gives life and that his words were spirit. And they impart life. But the, the chief leaders, the scribes, the religious of the time, the Jews just couldn't get it. In fact, we find at that time, many of his disciples turned and walked with him no longer. So we find elements of what we see in today's passage, as well as Matthew chapter 16, Mark 8, of, of this matter of who is Jesus. So let's look at that together now, if you will. We'll be reading verses 18 down to verse 22. Uh, I will not be uh, teaching on verses 21 and 22 today, though. All right, Luke chapter 9, verses 18 through 22. And it happened, as he was alone praying, that his disciples joined him, and he asked them, saying, Who do the crowds say that I am? So they answered and said, John the Baptist, but some say Elijah, and others say that one of the old prophets has risen again. He said to them, and them would be the twelve, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered said, the Christ of God. And he strictly warned and commanded them to tell this to no one saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Let us pray. Father, I pray that you would call and draw in this service. 
I continue to pray for seeds planted yesterday in that memorial service. But I pray that you would call and draw here this morning. I pray, Holy Spirit of God, that you would take your word and you would bring understanding that through the revelation of the word, people will see Jesus, his true identity. They will see their need for him. They will cry out to him as you call and draw. And Father, for those of us who know you, that we would be all the more confidence and have a resolve to share Jesus the Christ with others. Father, use this for your glory, use it for your honor, and as I often pray, two things. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be found acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And also, may your word speak to our entire inner person, our mind, our will, and our affection, our emotions. In Jesus' name, amen. We've all probably experienced something like this before, where someone will ask you, well, do you know so-and-so? Hey, wouldn't that be a good badge to, or a name tag to wear at a party or something? So-and-so. Oh, I've heard a lot about you. So-and-so. No, but, but we have all had things or, or uh, experiences where someone asks if you know a particular person, and you say, yeah, I, I know that. But to the extent of how we know them differs, does it not? I mean, we, we would say we have acquaintances, and then we have friends, and then we even have close friends and, and dear friends, and I guess they have the B... F, F now, is that right? Yeah, yeah, whatever. But we can say, do you know so-and-so? Yeah, I know him. And we in our mind have oftentimes from our observations of so-and-so have an opinion of that individual, right? And that opinion is based on how well we really know them. And I think it's always fair when we say, yeah, I, I, I know who they are, but I really don't know them. And so that seems like an oxymoron. I, I know them and I don't know them. Right? Well, I think it's true for a lot of people. And this may sound judgmental, again, just basing it on observation of people who say they know Jesus, but they don't know him. Do we have scripture to support that? I, I believe we do. And then let's just consider, and that's today's title, Jesus Christ. Who do you say that he is? And do you realize who he is to you has eternal consequences? Do you realize that? Well, what's the big deal? How about heaven and hell? That's the big deal. I was thinking about this today, or this this past week as I studied, and I, I thought, well, we find in Scripture that Satan knows who Jesus is. I'll remind you in in Luke chapter four. And I'm just I'm going to try to stick with mostly Luke passages since we've been studying it for about twelve years now, but. In Luke chapter 4, verse 3, and the devil said to him. Now, this is when Jesus is being tempted. You know, the Spirit of God drove him. After the baptism, the Spirit of God drove him into the wilderness to be tempted. In 40 days, 40 nights, he was there, tempted by Satan. And in Luke chapter 4, verse 3, it says, And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of, of God, command this stone to become bread. And he asked that question, if you are the son of God, he knew full well, and he knows full well. I don't need to 
speak in past tense because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus, the Son of God, Jesus, the Son of Man, lives, he rules, he reigns, he sits at the right hand of the Father. And Satan, the prince of the power of the air, the ruler of this world, knows who Jesus is. How about the demons? We read in Luke 4, verse 33, 34. Now in the synagogue there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. The demons believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Holy One of God. And yet, do they uh, follow Him? Do they know Him to know Him as far as Lord and Savior? No, they, they are hostile towards Him. They rejected Him. We won't put the Scripture up on the, on the screen yet of what we just read. But we see when Jesus asked about who to... Who do the crowds, who do the people say that I am? He was referring to the common people. He wasn't referring to the, to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He, he knew what they thought. He knew of their rejection of him. But I'm, in, I'm encouraged that as we look through the New Testament, we hear testimonies, people declaring who Jesus is. That in their time, they recognized him by the grace of God and a revelation of God. They recognized Jesus as being the Messiah, the anointed one, the sent one of God. They recognized him in their life prior to him going to the cross, dying, being buried, and rising again the third day. They recognized him as the Christ. Uh, in John chapter 1, verse 49, and these are just verses I'll be reading to you before we actually put some... Verses on the, on the wall. John 1, Nathaniel, also known as Bartholomew, answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. This was before he even started following Christ. This is before he was named one of the apostles. That he recognized this rabbi as being the Son of God. To say the Son of God, you're saying he is God. He's deity. You are the king of Israel. My mind went to the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4. Jesus comes along at noon. He's tired. He's weary. I'll save you all the details. You can look there for yourself. Has a conversation with her. Explains to her that he is the Messiah. That he is living waters that she can take and drink from. When the conversation was over, she left that conversation along with her, her water pot and she says, come see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? And it, it wasn't a question of, I'm not quite sure, I believe. Could this not be? The, is this not the Christ? So there's someone, there's a Samaritan woman recognizing the true identity of Jesus. The people of that same town, when you look at verse 42... The, the, the Samaritans of that same town, they said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. So, though the religious bunch of the day rejected Christ, and was judged because of that rejection, and their hearts hardened all the more, there were others that were seeing who he really was, or really is. A Samaritan woman with a train wreck of a past. The other Samaritans of that, other Samaritans of that town. But what about other people? How about Martha? We read about Jesus saying, I am the resurrection and the life, that he was speaking to Martha and when he asked her a question, do you believe this? In verse 27 of John 11, she said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into this world. She believed that. Do you? And how about Thomas, doubting Thomas? We can, we can connect with doubting Thomas, can't we? He, he only wanted to see what the others got to see. 
And he wasn't going to be satisfied till he did get to see what the others got to see. And upon seeing the risen Christ and putting his finger in the nail prints of his hand and of Jesus' hand and his hand in the pierced side of Jesus, Thomas declared this, my Lord and my God. So there were people that recognized by the grace of God and God's revelation of who Christ is, recognized him as being God. So why would Jesus ask this question? I can tell you it wasn't for some ego trip. And it wasn't because of insecurities. Eric, can we have the verse on the first slide, please? First of many. No, there's not many today. And it happened as he was alone praying that his disciples joined him and he asked them, saying, Who do the crowds say that I am? He said to them, they, they gave an answer and we'll talk about that. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Hmm. So why was Jesus inquiring? Why was he feeling for answers here? Different times he'll ride home from the service. And when it's just me in the old truck, I, I wonder how it went. How did that go? I wonder how that went. And, and I, I won't ask my wife. But my wife knows that I could be encouraged or discouraged. And sooner or later, as we ride home, when we do ride home together from faith, she'll say that that was lousy. That was terrible. You should have worked a lot harder on it. No, she'll say that was good. A and I'm encouraged. I do care what she thinks. What, because I want to please her? Well, well, sure. But what more importantly... I want to know that I fed the flock today. I want to know that I was true to the word today. So I do care what, what others have to say. And so I suppose there's an element of, of insecurity there. There's an element of, uh, of wanting to be encouraged just a little bit. But I can tell you truthfully as well that I want to know that I put it out there today, that, that I fed the flock today, that God's word went forth People had the opportunity to hear the gospel. Uh, those who know the gospel were edified, built up, encouraged a little bit. Uh, that's the reason I want to know. You know, I've come home from studies or like yesterday's show, how did it go? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how it went. But it went. Well, that's not why Jesus was inquiring. He wasn't pumping the crowd here that the apostles for any other reason than this. He wanted to know where they were at in their own beliefs. Did he know where they were at in their beliefs? Absolutely. Does he know where we are at in our beliefs? Absolutely. But just like anything else, we need to see it. We need to hear it from our own mouths. We need to say, God, search me and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Uh, God, reveal to me what you already know. And so he asked them, who, who do the people say that I am? Who do the crowds, the common people? I already know about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. I, I know about them. I don't need to know what they think. But what's the talk on the street? What's the hubbub out there? Well, since you asked, <laughs> how many of you have ever asked a question and wish you never asked the question? In fact, after a while, you just learn, don't ask the question. Especially if some people, you don't, you don't, you don't ask them how they're feeling. Okay? You don't have time for that. It's not that you don't care, but you already know what you're going to hear. Well, maybe I just dug a hole. <laughs> Anyhow, you understand. That's the thing. You understand. Well, I don't even know where I'm at now. I just threw myself right off the tracks. Who do the crowds say that he is? Well, Jesus. Some say John the Baptist. 
Just like Herod did a few months ago, in fact, Herod with his haunted conscience. Herod thinks you're John the Baptist. He's still convinced you're John the Baptist. Risen from the dead, haunting him still. Some say you're one of the prophets. Some say that you're Elias, or Elijah, Elias in the King James, Elijah, or you're Jeremiah. Because the Jews truly believed that the coming at the coming of Christ, the old prophets would raise from or rise from the dead. So that's why they were saying, I, this, "This is Elijah. This is Jeremiah." Jesus was like them in in some regards, but Jesus is like no other. Class all of his own. The only one who is fully God and fully man. He is the prophet that was to come that we read in Deuteronomy. He was and he is the prophet that was to come. But no, he's not any of them. He's not John the Baptist. He's not one of the prophets. He's not mortal man. He's the true and living God. So then he asked the question, Specifically, but who do you say that I am? An impetuous Peter, as we know him, right? Always quick to shoot from the hip. And so many times spitting sandal leather out of his mouth afterwards. And we know what that's like at times too, don't we? Not me. Okay. So let me give you a verse from James. Be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. That will, that will help you out, James 1.19. Peter's declaration of who Jesus is. Who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus to you? I think a lot of times there's empty professions out there. Let me understand that. And I don't mean profession as far as a work profession, but, but people making professions with their mouth. I was reminded of this as I was studying, just think it came to mind and I thought about it. I'm going to share it with you from Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, where Jesus says this. And so I want to caution you and, and even let the word of God challenge you as far as who is Jesus Christ to you? Who is he to you? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. So does our saying match our doing? How many is getting this? Because you can, you can say that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is the Holy One, and yet you don't practice that in your life. I was at a funeral dinner yesterday. You know, and you walk into the place and everybody turns their head and, oh, I hope he doesn't sit down here. And so I, I, I'm looking and there's a chair and so I finally sit down there. And one of the guys, I, I know one of the guys, there wasn't many I knew there, really there weren't, and that's why I was getting the cold shoulder. But anyhow, not that I'm insecure or anything like that. This brother in the Lord says, so what are you preaching on tomorrow, Scott? And I told him what I was preaching on. I said, I don't know yet, it's Saturday. It's not Saturday night yet. I'll go on the internet and find something. I, I don't know what I'm preaching on tomorrow, how would I know? No, of course I didn't say that. And so I was able to quickly share with him right there. And, and he, he saw the, the good opportunity for evangelism out of that passage. And it's not that, you know, I just flipped through and point. You know that we're going through the Gospel of Luke. So I thought, well, what an opportunity here. There's people around this table. I'm still got boldness from, from the Spirit of God from the funeral. Little timid Scott's sitting a little bit more upright in his chair. And it says to a former retired county commissioner across the table. I said, so who do you say that Jesus is? Well, I could say that he's part of God or that he is God. I said, well, yeah, you could. I said, but I'm asking you, who do you say that he is? He's the Savior of the world. And that's how it was said, and then it was, it was gone. It was left at that. Do I know where he stands? No, I don't. 
Did he have the right answer? Absolutely. The Savior of the world is the right answer. Don't be trying to figure out who this is. This guy's retired for years and years. I won't describe him. I won't share his name. What about you? And do you have the understanding? Do you realize you can say who Jesus is? And you can say it right. You can have his identity perfect, pegged, according to Scripture, and yet not know this man. And to not know this man is to not know eternal life. Oh, you have eternal life, you have eternal soul, but you will not spend eternity with him without knowing him. And so I just encourage you to let the Spirit of God, the Word of God, challenge your heart in this whole matter of who is Jesus. And the the concern of empty professions. Let's see the next passage from Matthew 15. Where he says, you hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, this people, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is, what church, far from me. Does our profession and our heart, are they coupled together? Is what we say of Christ true in our inner being? And and by the way, we can have our opinion, but we don't change who Jesus is. Just like people can have their opinion of others, but that doesn't truly identify them or define them. And so this is just a little extra I throw in for nothing. Let's be careful on our judging others. I said to myself the other day, it was one of those days where I was willing to talk to myself. You know, the more I know, the more I realize I don't know. Some are saying, you're finally getting that, Scott. I'm 57 now. I finally got that. You understand what I mean, though? So I let our words be few. And don't say things that are going to tear others down. And don't throw your opinions loosely out there about others. You don't know. Just like I don't know. I don't know where the retired commissioner stands with his answer, the Savior of the world. I don't know. But one thing I do know, Jesus is the Savior of the world. World meaning universal salvation? No, not at all. But meaning that all those who will respond to his gracious call by faith, he saves them. John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So, well, we need to move on. And let's look at this matter. So, let's look from Matthew's gospel. uh, Adds a little bit to it in in, uh, comparison to Luke. So, Matthew chapter 16, verses 16 and 17, if we may, Eric. Yeah, the lights are flickering. That's okay, as long as they don't go out. So, let's look at that together. Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ. So the same question was asked. The same question was asked. Who do men say that I am? So it's the same setting, okay? Just a little bit different information. In fact, and I I hurried over it, and I wish I hadn't, but I'm not going to go back. In Luke's account that we just read, we see that Jesus was alone praying. He often did that. We read in Scripture where he got up early before daylight and was praying. We read where he spent all night in prayer. We know that Jesus tells us, and and when you pray, so he's given us direction that we should be people of prayer. In Luke 18, he says, man ought always to pray and not to lose heart. In Philippians 4, 6, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to God. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. So we are encouraged by God's word to be people of prayer. And Jesus always practiced what he preached. And so his disciples, it was nothing for them to find him praying. And it wasn't a show, trust me. It 
And so he was praying. In Luke's or in Matthew's account, after the question is asked of who do men say, who do the crowds, who do men say that I am, here's Peter's answer from Matthew's account. Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus asked and said to him, Blessed are you, or, or Jesus answered, not asked, Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. This is huge. This is big. Why do I say that? Well, first of all, before we get there, the Son of the living God, the, the phrase living God, 30 times we find it. In Scripture, or at least in my translation, we see it throughout the Old Testament. Living God, living God, living God. Moses made mention of it. Joshua made mention of it. David, when he faced the psalmist, makes mention of it. Uh, David, when Goliath was blowing and and making the armies of of Israel uh, shake in their sandals, David says, (laughs) for who is this? uncircumcised Philistine that he shall defy the armies of the living God. The living God, what does it even mean? Well, it means that he is the only true God, but he's living. Everything else was just dead, dumb idols. The creation of man's hand, of stone or or out of wood, but they mean nothing. They are not God. And so, Peter, by the Spirit of God, by the Father's revelation to him, makes a comment that is very much found in the Old Testament, and that is, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Christ, in the Old Testament, it's Messiah. It means the anointed one, the sent one, meaning God. And so Jesus is God, and Peter is saying, he says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so then Jesus says to him, blessed are you, Peter, and blessed is everyone else. He doesn't say that here, but I am saying this. Blessed is everyone who knows Jesus Christ, knows him to be the Messiah, the the anointed one, the sent one, knows him to be the Son of God, knows him in their life, has the life of him living within. Blessed are you. Simon Bar-Jonah. Bar-Jonah simply means the son of Jonah. And, and flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. In other words, you didn't come up with this on your own, nor did anybody else teach you this. But revelation of God brought this to you. And this is so important that we understand this. And we're going to see it from John's account where it's God who does reveal himself to us. It is God who calls us and draws us to him. You and I wouldn't have a clue without God opening up our understanding. Do you get that? Because if it was something we'd do, it'd be just like in, Philipp- or in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's a, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. It's nothing that you and I would have come to on our own. We're totally b- depraved. We're spiritually dead. And until God calls and draws and, and awakens and reveals to us himself, we don't get it. Those things are spiritually discerned, and we are spiritually dead until the Spirit of God brings us life. And so he said, Peter, you're right. Spot on, pal. (laughs) You know, here's this fisherman. This fisherman that God in his goodness and his his love and his, his elect of grace calls and brings understanding to this man. And aren't you glad that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever? Because he's continuing to reveal himself to others. And taking them from spiritually dead and now putting a spiritual heartbeat with them. And their life now uh, throbs and it abounds through the life of Christ. Has he revealed himself to you? You could give the textbook answer. You could give the biblical answer. Yes, Jesus Christ is, is the Son of God. He's the Holy One. He's the king of Israel. He's the savior of the world. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, but do you, do you know that? 
do you truly know that by experience? Do you know him? Do you know him? You see, this is why Jesus was at. This is a pivotal point in their ministry. So this is now about two years into the ministry. And this is where then Jesus declares, hey, we're going to go to Jerusalem. And to keep it short, I'll be scourged, mocked, scourged, crucified, buried, and rise again the third day. And again, in Matthew's account, Peter says, no way. See, he's preparing them for what's coming. And so he asked them this question so that they really had a thorough understanding and knew for themselves where we stand on this matter. Because we're eventually headed to Jerusalem now, and it's going to get bad. It's going to get tough, and you need to be sure where you're at in this. Now, turn over to John's gospel real quickly. We have a few minutes yet. And uh, <clears throat> I, again, the setting is... is near uh, where we're at because all four gospel accounts share the feeding of the 500 men plus women and children. I may remember that. Three from last week. That was last week. Oh, oh No, no, I do, Pastor. I remember. Okay. Well, anyhow, we, we find that in Matthew 14, in Mark 6, in Luke uh, 9, and John 6. So as you follow through Luke 6, this is a continuation of conversation after the fact. Other things of ministry had transpired since, since the feeding of the 500 or the 5,000. You can read about that in Matthew, Mark, and, and John. Luke goes right from the feeding to where we're at today. But other ministries had taken place in and out of Galilee, but soon now to make their way into Jerusalem. And I just draw your attention to verse 44. It's not going to be up on the screen. But Jesus says, and verse 41, by the way, uh, says the Jews then complained about him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. So now there's, there's, there's murmuring, complaining going on. And Jesus says in verse 44, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up the last day. And I don't need to see a show of hands, but... Many of us can look back on our lives and see uh, the long-suffering of God, how he was calling, how he was drawing, how he was speaking, right? I mean, I can remember as a five-year-old uh, believing in, in God and, and knowing that he was all-powerful. And that he could protect me, or he could not. He could allow this to happen, or he could not. And, and so that, in my thinking, was, was the beginning of the calling and the drawing and the revealing of himself to me. When you work down through John's account here in chapter 6, again, you find Jesus explaining to them who he is. He's the bread of life, the true bread. Uh, not the manna which they, the, the forefathers had, had eaten, but, but the true bread of heaven. He's the living bread, so on. He talks about uh, being the one who, had, or being the one the Father has sent, and he who feeds on me will live because of me. Verse 57, they're complaining about this. They find it offensive. Verse 63 says, it is the Spirit who gives life. Jesus is saying, it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they're life. Then he says this, but there are some of you who do not believe. You know, on the outside, they would have looked like true followers of Christ. They probably talked like it. They probably acted like it. And yet Jesus says there, there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were, who did not believe, and who would betray him. And then we see this, and these two verses will be on the screen for you, on the wall. And he said, therefore I have, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. From that time, 
many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. I share this periodically, purposely. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. God takes his word, and his word does not return void. And that's the confidence I have, whether it's after a funeral, a Sunday morning preaching time, teaching time, a Tuesday night, a Wednesday night, that if God's word goes forth, it's going to accomplish what he will with it. And it was not a waste of time. And he uses his word to call and to draw. The Spirit takes the word of God, the author of the word of God. The Spirit takes it and uses it as a means to bring revelation and to use it as a means of drawing people to God. And so he just as Jesus said to Simon, son of Jonah, uh, great, you're right, I am the Messiah, the sent one of God, the Holy One of God. And you came to this understanding through my Father, through the Spirit of God. Have you come to that understanding? No one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. And so that was a breaking point. Many of his disciples uh, went back, walked with him no more. And see, it can be like that in churches where people, if you ask who Jesus is, he's the Savior of the world. But they don't know him. At least these ones turned and walked no more. They they quit the, the pretending, if you will. There was one who stayed there clear till the Lord's Supper, the the Passover meal. His name was Judas. So for about another year, he, he continues walking. And how do I know that's true? Well, Jesus said this. Did I not choose 12 and yet one of you is a devil? Speaking of Judas Iscariot. Well, Here again, we see Peter answering a question that's not even asked. The question that is asked is, do you want to go away? Look at verse 67 of of John 6. Then Jesus said to the twelve, do you also want to go away? So we have all these disciples, all these followers. And when they're hearing Jesus' word, that's that's it. For some of them, we, we just can't do this anymore. Why? Because they weren't called. They weren't drawn. They, they, hey, this looks good. This sounds good. Yeah, we'll join the happy throng here. But when they started hearing what Jesus was saying, they, no. No. Some of you don't believe, and so some of them walked with them no more. And so now Jesus says to the twelve, do you also want to go away? You guys cutting out too? Here was Peter's answer. Go ahead. But Simon Peter answered, said, Lord, to whom shall we go? But here's testimony. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. We have come to know. We have been observing you for two years, Jesus. We've heard you. We've watched you. We have seen the signs and the wonder. We have seen the dead raised, the blinds, blinded eyes being opened, deaf ears being opened as well. No, we're not going anywhere. There was one that would, one of the 12 that would. Peter was confident. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Can we, have, can we who truly know that Jesus is our Lord and Savior, He is the Christ, the Holy One of God, can we have weak moments where we deny that, where we fall away, where we just sort of hide our light under a bushel? Yeah. And we see that in Peter's life. But on the day of Pentecost, which by the way, the Christian calendar today is the day of Pentecost, Pentecost, 
you see a boldness and you don't see him backing down. You do see a little waver. We find that in Galatians where Peter joined himself to the Gentiles and then because of pressure of the Jews. So do we see a perfect life after someone comes to Christ is my whole point here? No. But do we see a determined, no, you are the Christ. You are my Lord. You are my Savior. Yes. Yes, we see that. And so the question is, is this. And an old song came to mind as I was working through this in my head. It just, it, 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 I was reminded of it. Because the bottom line, the application is this. So what will you do with Jesus? A.B. Simpson, the founder of the Christian Missionary Alliance, over 115 years ago, wrote this song. Jesus is standing in Pilate's hall, friendless, forsaken, betrayed by all. Hearken, what meaneth that sudden call? What will you do with Jesus? Jesus is standing on trial still. You can be false to him if you will. You can be faithful through good or ill. What will you do with Jesus? Will you evade him as Pilate tried, or will you choose him whate'er betide? Vainly you struggle from him to hide. What will you do with Jesus? Jesus, I give thee my heart today. Jesus, I'll follow thee all the way. Gladly obeying thee, will you say, this I will do with Jesus? Consider that. That's a refrain of the song, What Will You Do With Jesus? How many can hear the melody playing? I'm not going to sing it, don't worry. But what, what will you, it, it, I'm singing inside. What will you do with Jesus? Neutral you cannot be. He's the Savior of the world. He is. Is He your Savior? He's the Holy One of God, the Messiah, the Sent One, the Christ. He is. Do you know him that way? What we do with Jesus does not change who Jesus is. Someday your heart will be asking, what will he do with me? In John's gospel, we read this in verse 30 of chapter 20. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Eric. Eric. But these are written, these are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have what, church? Have life in his name. One of the closing verses that I used yesterday, I kept adding, and this is the testimony. He who has the Son has life. Let me let me read that to you because I just got it wrong. I had the second verse in my or the twelfth verse in my head there. And this is a t- testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. And so he's not talking about an intellectual understanding up here. And Jesus is much more than the Doobie Brothers saying about Jesus is just all right with me. No, no, no. This is a matter where, where Jesus, in my understanding, according to the word of God, is the Holy One of God. He's the sent one. He's the Christ. And I have turned from my sins and I have come to Him and now I know Him. And that's why John says that the Gospel has been written. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. Let's stand Worship team, if you'll come. Father, you know every heart here. You know where it's real deal and where it's an empty profession. 
And whether that be here in this congregation or whether it be viewers on social media, wherever, there has always been wheat and tares. True followers and lookalikes who aren't. I pray that the question of who is Christ, who is Jesus, will continue to challenge our hearts and our minds. And that we who know you, Jesus, your spirit, spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, that we would cling to you all the more. And those who don't would come. They'd hear your gracious call, and they would come. For your glory, God, I pray these things. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you that the truth of who Jesus is, his true identity is found in your word. He is the Messiah. He is the Christ. He is the Holy One of God. He is God. What do we do with that? Again, what will you do with Jesus? Neutral you cannot be. Someday your heart will be asking, What will he do with me? Father, continue to draw people to your son, Jesus, the Savior of the world. In his name I pray. Amen.